You're listening to episode 5 of the Library TechCast. The LOC is gone. This episode is recorded live on October 4th, Friday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Enjoy! This podcast is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Listen to other great tech podcasts at www.techpodcasts.com. Welcome to episode 5 of the Library TechCast. Today on the episode, we talk about the government shutdown, uh, a new permalink product, and is the internet the new banned book in honor of last week's banned book week. Uh, Let me introduce myself. I'm Jeffrey Sable. I'm a reference and instruction librarian at Concordia University, Irvine. Um, In addition to delivering uh, instruction, I also um, and I'm the resident tech at this small library in Irvine, California. Um, and I'm interested in uh, all, all types of different library technology, especially uh, open source. Um, I'll throw it over to my co-host. Riley, go ahead. Hello, my name is Riley Childs. I am in beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina today. Uh, well, all the time. Uh, I am the student librarian at Charlotte United Christian Academy. I also do IT administration on the side, um, and I do a lot with library technologies. Okay, so we are going to get started off today. Uh, we're going to get started with the talking about the government shutdown and really what that means to us and how it affects us. Um, we are actually, it's really more of a, right now, the Library of Congress website is up. Um, I cannot speak as far as the APIs go, um, but as far as I can tell, the Library of Congress website is up. Let me check. So one thing we were talking about, I it came up on uh, LibChat this week, is I was uh, made a comment somewhat uh, off the cuff about why why wouldn't they just keep these websites up and running, and the, the topic of... Uh, came up of, you know, how much does it cost to keep a, a website just up, you know, just the server costs of cooling them. I mean, you mentioned the cooling costs, but I mean, you know, what do you, what do you think a, a general guesstimate of, of the cost of running, you know, these different websites from, from the government? Um, someone is probably going to come after me again. <laughs> I am, I'm off, but it really depends on the size of your data center. Um, dep- and you're going to sit down, and if you're building a data center, you know that um, your your cooling is going to be two thirds of your electricity costs right there. And in some cases, it's nine tenths. It's ninety percent of your of your electricity goes to cooling, um, uh, and um, and especially. So, that, in so the- yeah, so that's a hidden cost that that. Um- you know, most people don't think about when when we mm-hmm. talk about the government shutdown, how we're affected. LOC.gov is down, so that's affecting a lot of cataloging. Um, I mean, I think that could sort of wait. One one thing at my school we're sort of impacted by is um, is uh, Eric the educational research um, database uh, that is run by um, the government is down so any anybody getting a master's degree in education pretty much uses this uh, database as um, a main a primary source of, of uh, research and information another interesting thing in, in that note is uh, EBSCO it, it actually some time ago started indexing the ERIC database which is free um, to everybody so you can actually just go to their or you could go to their website currently it's down but you could go. So EBSCO's uh, indexing basically an open source uh, website run by the government and um, charging people for, for that service, of course. And um, the, the interesting thing to note is um, they, they were the first corporation to join, um, let me see, the, the open access Scholarly Publishers Association, um, and what's unique about that is they may be the most forward-thinking of, of the large database um, databases out there that 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 sees an opportunity to make money off of open source journals, indexing them, and and other open source um, databases. 
Any thoughts on that, Riley? My my first thought is to say they should be free. Um, but <laughs> a cost of open source. Um, but yeah. Uh, but I mean, it makes sense well, that yeah, I mean that they're you know, charging for this because they it's it's a private it's a private institution, correct? What's that, EBSCO? Um, the people who are indexing, yeah. Or is yeah, EBSCO. yeah, yeah. So basically, you're paying for the discovery service, essentially, oh, oh. where where they're not where these these journals. I mean, if, theoretically, if you could go out there and find them either through Google Scholar or some other search engine, you would be able to find them for free. It's just EBSCO has one place where you could search them all, along with oh, okay. other paid databases. Okay, because I mean. Um, because I get, I guess, really, it's this is a very, very beautiful thing having the um, unification of all this data coming together. Because I know I've used Google Scholar before, but it just doesn't cover everything. So EBSCO will even search uh, for pay databases. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So I mean, theoretically. You could go if you have subscriptions, like because um, the majority of our databases are through EBSCO. I think um, besides ProQuest, undergraduate libraries are ex would experience the same sort of uh, situation. So when we go to EBSCO, we could search not only the paid databases through them, but you can um, if through their link resolver, it'll also search LexisNexis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and several other ones. So you're already, that's your already our, our primary discovery tool, I guess, for articles and um, electronic journals. And they're just adding on top of that. And I mean, you, you got to figure they're paying to index these somehow, um, but they're passing that a cost on to their, their customers. And like you said, you know, it's getting more and more towards a unified search system. Which, which maybe we could we could sort of talk about like the discover the different discovery um, products out there for a future show. So is there a decent API, Febsco? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh there is. Okay, so it's not just like you go to the Ebsco page and you search. So the okay, so because well, that, that... I mean that's essentially what they want you to do though. Oh, so they don't so they don't want you to be accessing their data through an API. No, no, but you can, you, um, they have a product where we've actually linked um, their I can't hear you. I don't know what just happened. Oh, I was muted for a second. I don't know. It said you muted me. Oh. Was I rambling on? Anyway, so um, right <laughs> now, right now they have a product that we just started where um, if you search Google Scholar and it's you know, the full text is available through a paid database that the library already subscribes to, mm -hmm. namely EBSCO, it'll it'll connect through there. So if you want to cast a wide net, you know, you're initially um, beginning your searches, you know, Google Scholar is the ideal um, tool to use because you're searching all of your library databases that you pay for and you're getting everything that that they have indexed, every full text article they've indexed out there as well. So I mean, you know, they're competing with Google Scholar's competing with EBSCO and other discovery services, but I mean, you know, right now I would say they're sort of neck and neck. And ultimately, you know, connecting a paid database to search through Google Scholar is you're still paying for that database, mm -hmm. right? You know, yeah, I mean, EBSCO yeah. still, um, still, you know making money off of your, your subscriptions. Mm -hmm. And so, so maybe uh, next week our show, our show may be, um, you know, we might get someone on from EBSCO to talk about why they joined um, this, this publishers association and, and maybe uh, thoughts or directions that they, they, they're moving forward to in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, okay then. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So really, and a little bit just more generally on the government shutdown. Um, so it looks like, I don't know why, but it looks like the LOC.gov APIs are back up. And I mean, that's a great thing. But I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering, did uh, they find money or something? Or did someone say you can take those back up? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little strange that they sort of they you know everything went down with um, the shutdown, maybe, but some things is coming back up. You know, maybe um, maybe the IT administrator sat on a button or something, <laughs> or bumped <laughs> into the bumped into something because. Um, can I know? Doesn't the Library of Congress also host some other sites in addition to um, this stuff? I think, I think they do. Yeah, because I think they host the Congress websites and stuff. And I think they may. I think like the Library of Congress might manage a, a data center or something, but I couldn't be sure. Um, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, on that. I mean, maybe maybe they approve special funding just for for the Library of Congress. Who knows? Or or maybe they have a funding source coming from you know because obviously Congress didn't shut down, so maybe they found a funding source you know within that that realm of of servicing yeah. Congress. Because I mean, I mean it's all here, and I mean I cannot. I'm sure. Um, Cause I know it was like on a what you call it on a Tuesday morning. Um, right, I right. went on to the Library of Congress website to see if it was still up. It was up, but when I at 12 p.m. Eastern time exactly, it went down. <laughs> the APIs were gone, and it was like you could just tell the guy who's in charge of managing the APIs and stuff. They must have said, "We have to be shut down by 12. We we're going to wait as long as possible." Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, because we don't want to. Because I mean, I mean, it's not that difficult to turn off a data center. In theory, you just kill the main power supply to <laughs> a, a cer certain number of racks. Um, but yeah, I know that it. Yeah, th this is this is just going to probably drag on forever. Um, and just want to remind anyone who is currently viewing, who is watching the show live, if you go to Bit bit.ly forward slash ltc5 join it will take you right to our google plus uh google plus hangout and you can uh join into the conversation and actually be part of it and have your your beautiful face appear on our screen once again that is bit.ly forward slash ltc5 join okay okay now on to the next thing um we're going to just touch on this we may we're probably going to talk about it a little bit more in depth in a future episode. Um, but there is a consortium or something of a consortium of, I guess, it looks like mostly law schools. Um, and they are using this site called PERMA, P-E-R-M-A dot C-C. And what it looks like is um, it's a whole... What they do is it's kind of like archive.org. They create a permalink to a version of a site. So I'll, I could um, generate a link. It's still in a closed beta, so you can't just go on and use it. Um, but, I mean, it looks very, very interesting, and uh, we're going to just touch on that later on. But... Um, yeah, so, I mean, it looks like it'll be, uh, you know, a URL, sort of like a DOI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like D space except it's for websites. Right, right. In a way. Yeah, yeah. That's what it looks like. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I first went to the website, it says websites change, go away, and are taken down. And I thought that meant that the project was no more. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, because <laughs> I mean, it, that's what it says. I mean, that. Well, right, that, oh. and I and I think I think this is growing out of. Um... You know, people cite data. They cite websites now in in scholarly articles, and when they cite something at a URL, and someone's site checking that months later before the article's published, and the site no longer exists, um, and you the, know, the, they'll run into some some trouble. Especially especially within the law, they're you know you you have to have a correct site, and you have to sort of trace where where you're citing it to. Because I know that um. This is a big problem, particularly on Wikipedia, where you'll go and I often use the um, the re the references links, and a lot of times they're dead links, which is very unfortunate. And I could see this having a huge loot use in that realm. Um, but 
moving yeah, so on. We'll, so yeah, moving on. We'll we'll probably uh, focus another show on on that, and uh, maybe sort of get someone from from Perma.cc over here to the show mm -hmm. and get their thoughts. So let's begin our main topic: the moment of truth, the thing you have all been waiting for. Um, our discussion on SIFA and the new fan books. And uh, you regret that. So yeah, so I guess we could just start start the discussion with a. Do you think um, SIFA, it's the Child's Internet uh, Protection Act, is even even useful these days? Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah. b. You know, is, is it really is it really protecting children from, um, you know, explicit images on the internet? Okay, so I'm reading uh, the cache page. What SIPA requires that I got that I downloaded earlier. Schools and libraries subject to SIPA are required to adopt and implement an internet safety policy addressing access by minor, minors to inappropriate matter on the internet. Define first of all, define inappropriate. B. The safety and security of minors when using electronic mail, chat rooms, and other forms of direct electronic communications. C. Unauthorized access, including so-called hacking and other unlawful activities by minors online. D. Unauthorized disclosure, use, dissemination of personal information regarding minors. And E. Restricting minors' access to materials harmful to them. Who gets to decide what... Um, materials are harmful to minors. And, the, and those, Whose you know, and these, yeah, yeah, and these are these are arguments that are, uh, you know, been, have been discussed. But one one new argument that I sort of ran into when I was looking at some of the literature on this was, aren't these aren't these uh, children outside of school now, outside of the public library? Uh, you know, 10 years ago, you went to the public library, and that was maybe one of the only places that had internet access. But nowadays, mm -hmm. any kid with a phone, um, you know, can basically get to any website they want. So, is this really protecting them in any substantial way? Is you know, is the entire idea of this so antiquated and passed by um, people so unfamiliar with technology? that and 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 the general um idea of who has access to technology <laughs> Oops. sorry that was my phone yeah yeah no oh. worries yeah so i mean you know outside of public schools and public libraries they i and it's my belief that you know they would have access anyway so so censoring websites which is uh against i mean it's against the the, the ala's library bill of rights it's against um, most fundamental beliefs that librarians have, and, and I think that now is the time to um, to push for change, for for change of, of you know the implementation or the repeal, and find uh, other ways to to protect children, which you know theoretically are already out there. I mean, if you expose a child to pornographic images, whether you're at a public library or not, that's a crime, regardless, you know, regardless of your free speech rights, um, or I should say in spite of your free speech rights. So I think there's already mechanisms out there to um, protect children from, from gross or um, huge um, people who, who hugely violate the law. So, I mean... And, it, oh, and it's actually really interesting. Um, I was reading through the, I was reading through the um, page, and it has one really interesting thing at the end. SIPA does not require the tracking of internet use by minors or adults. I know for a fact that libraries are doing this. Oh, that they're tracking, tracking they, where people they're go. They're not tracking; they're logging where you go, and that's huh. and that's mainly because the U.S. District Attorney has come knocking in the past and has said, "We need these records of this person that accessed this." And I know the libraries have said, "We don't have that because we don't keep logs." And now most, a lot of libraries are keeping logs because they would rather. Um, 
it's it's just it's just getting out of hand in my opinion in some of this stuff. It's right, it's right, right. Very it's um very very vague. It it doesn't say this. It just kind of says anything that may be considered inappropriate for children. It's kind oh, of like right, right. yeah, it's kind and of I like mean, this is what happens when when they pass laws where um they have really no understanding of, of technology. Mm -hmm. you know? When was this passed? 2001? Um, I want to say even before that. Yeah. I thought it was like 97, right? Um, well, they updated it. It was enacted by Congress in 2000, and it was updated okay. in 2001. Okay. And I mean, it, it's largely um, withstood all legal challenges, so... Legally, according, I mean, I think even the Supreme Court ruled on on some aspect of it, but legally, it it seems to be um, not going anywhere. But I mean, you know, write your congressman. Um, I think I think anybody who who advocates for freedom of speech and uh, freedom of access to all information should should really stand up against this in this law, where where they really used fear of of hurting children to enact something that's that's really more hindering than helping. Uh, oh, um, yeah, yes. Oh shoot. Um, oh, there's yeah, a whole so, bunch. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, and and one one aspect of where you say, well, how can internet filters block? X and and there was one public library that was blocking uh, pro homosexual websites where there was a large homosexual community or a gay community and and there was kids who who were uh, you know children of gay parents and they they were somehow you know unable to perform research about those types of relationships. Hence, they seem like, oh, these are wrong somehow because they're being blocked or they're somehow, you know, they're harmful to children when, you know, most people would think mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, you know, so that's just one small example of where you get into the tricky business of saying this is harmful to children or this is harmful to children and, you know, you don't really uh, have a line where, where you, you know, you don't evaluate what what you're blocking and and that goes back to you know educate people about the harmful things and have real consequences but I don't think you can have a a blanket policy or I I think that a lot of these filtering technologies are um, overreaching opposed to you know scientifically targeting specific sites oh 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 yeah 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 I mean. It's really more of, it's not really a science, it's really more of, I'm going to throw out a net, and I'm going to see, and whatever gets pulled in, that's going to be blocked. Right, and most li most public library policies, from what I gathered, were, uh, if we'll block all this stuff, because we don't want to be sued, and then if you ask for something to be unblocked, then we'll evaluate that particular site. So it's almost mm -hmm. like... You know, well, like you said, they're gonna they're gonna pull in everything they can or anything that falls into a certain category, and then it's up to the patron to somehow request access How do you to request it. it. I mean, um, I was just there was there the um, last case. Um, it was the Federal Communications. Oh, it was in the Federal Communications Law Journal where they were talking about. Um, they were talking about the policies of a of a library, a uh, public library. I want to say, I'm not sure where the library was, but that was their policy, and they found mm -hmm. that constitutional. They found well, that within a within the realm of um, of SIPA, and, and in addition, nobody's rights to uh, access to information were being violated in the public library. And, and you know, everybody says, well, you know, the idea of the public library is free information when when information wasn't really free. Well, here's the thing. When you read more into it, it only requires that schools supply if they are getting discounts through E-rate. Um, schools and what have you, when they're getting, like, discounts through E-rate, which I believe is something to do with um, 
Oh, I thought it was any that had got federal funding. Oh yeah, I think that's what E rate is. Yeah, okay. I think. Okay. Yeah. I think in general, uh, it's required of any school. Um, but it's especially required of schools that receive federal funding. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe, yeah, I'm. I, I may be wrong. Um, I, but, it, but it just may be there may be easier ways to implement or to uh, to force schools into doing it where, um, you know, if you're not getting federal funding, it, it's probably your, you know, your corporate counsel or whoever's advising the school legally is telling you to do it opposed to a mandate from the government. But I mean, I'm yeah. sure there's there's motivation from all schools to implement this just so they're not open and opening themselves up to litigation. Well, I've seen, um, I've seen, like, for example, the, um, whatchamacallit, the library here, they use OpenDNS to block stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and is that, I, I mean, I'm not really familiar with really blocking technologies um, uh, oh, yeah, or filtering, yeah. filtering <laughs> technologies. Is that, is that a big one? Um, open DNS, what it is, is it's basically it's a faster DNS, but they offer the ability to block sites, um, which if you're able to um, change your DNS settings, if you if you have statically configured DNS settings and you're using your laptop, it really isn't that much of, an, of a, um, it, you can get around it easily by changing your DNS settings. But um, if you're on a lockdown computer, it works very well. And I'm not saying that it's good, but it works very well to block sites. I'm not. Techno I'm not technology uh, wise, technologically. Yeah, yeah. Te technologically wise, I'm not saying that the filtering itself is good. But you, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> and it actually says, it actually says one in three schools in the U.S. use OpenDNS. Um, the Los Angeles Unified School District is listed as one of them. Um, which implies to me that maybe that was how the iPads were hacked. The <laughs> DNS settings were changed. I mean, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but enough on that. Um, but yeah, so internet filtering in general, it's it's really more of a we're just gonna throw, we're gonna take this fishing net that we have, we're gonna Google porn, and we're gonna block all the sites that come up. Right, Even and, and, and and the idea is that that's somehow going to protect children, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it, I mean, if they have a phone with them, they can go anywhere they want. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, more and more research is being done on on what age is uh, our children being exposed to graphic images. And I, I mean, me, you know, I'm. I, when I was growing up, there were, you know, there were no computers. So I mean, yeah. the, the jump from then to now is is astronomical. Oh, 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 yes, of course it is. It's just, it's like one day there. I mean, it just happened so fast. It happened in relatively almost 20 years, which in, mm -hmm. which, it was like a revolution that occurred in 20 years, which in like. In general, in history, it takes thousands of years for this sort of thing to happen. Um, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, as we slowly – we are going to begin to wind down. Um, before we go, Jeff, do you have any more uh, last comments on uh, So um, Yeah, so I, I encourage anybody to um, go to the ALA website and download the Library Bill of Rights. Um, mm -hmm. And and you know read them, know them, take them to heart, and really begin to protect people's access to information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yes. So we are going to close this up. I mean, I just want to leave everyone with the idea that web filtering is, depending on what you're filtering, is okay. Um, if I am the if I go through and I s select the sites that I know are bad, but being rather than doing everything that I know could be bad, doing the stuff that I know is bad, understanding that stuff may fall through the cracks, um, because the goal is not to 
is to make sure that the children are not exposed to stuff that is horrible, that is um, just absolutely graphic. But I mean, the whole the whole idea of web filtering in general, from a perspective of not within SIPA, but within this whole net neutrality argument that should they slow down my internet access? Should they block my internet access? Like in the UK, there's an opt-out service in which pornographic websites and websites in general are blocked by the ISP, and that's required by law to be an opt-out service. That's not right. Yeah, um, that's you should not... be able to decide what you access. And in, But in schools, for example, that's not the student's home, but but there still needs to be a certain level of access that is maintained that is free, even when there is the occasion that a site may slip through the cracks. Yeah, Rather and than, um, yeah. sort of coincidentally on this note, the, um, the South Park this week sort of speaks um, pretty point pointedly about, um, about this exact subject. So if you have a chance, I recommend this week's um, South Park. Okay. Um, ironically, talking about web filtering, talking about South Park. Um, well, yeah, they, yeah, they, they. It's, it's about, yeah, it's about web filtering. I mean, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty funny. It's sort of um, reverse, where they have to filter the the parents' um, view, cable viewing habits, and it also has Minecraft on there as well. So nice. It's got something for everybody. See. So I'm 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 uh, so I guess we'll wrap it up here. Uh, I'm Jeff Sable. Uh, I'll throw it over to my co-host Riley for the closings. Um, okay. So I would just like to remind everybody that uh, we have well, you can follow us on Twitter. We are at Library Techcast. You can watch previous episodes by going to our website LibraryTechcast.com. You can also find us on iTunes, um, YouTube, and Stitcher Radio, and Last week I said that I would start doing episode bites, uh, but that really never came to fruition because I didn't have time. But this week I'm definitely going to start doing um, individual segments of episodes on YouTube. That way you can watch them. Um, but so follow us on Twitter at Library Techcast. Um, like us on Facebook. We're facebook.com forward slash Library Techcast. Subscribe to us on YouTube. We're youtube.com forward slash library tech cast. Um, and if you have any comments on the show, send us an email comments at library techcast.com. And that goes to both me and Jeffrey in our personal emails. Um, if you, uh, off the of thought, if you would like to be a guest or want to suggest a show topic, please email info at library techcast.com. Um, so, uh, I hope everybody has a great week. I hope that, that all that information is not too overwhelming. Um, but uh, for the Library TechCast, I'm Riley Childs. And I'm Jeff Sable. You just listened to an episode of the Library TechCast. Join us next week on Friday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time when we will be discussing PERMA, a project to prevent dead links and archive websites. You can now find us on Stitcher Radio. You can download the app on Google Play or the iOS App Store. You can now follow us on Twitter. We're at Library TechCast. You can also like us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Library TechCast. Audio listeners can now watch episode segments on youtube.com forward slash library techcast. Have a great week. We would like to give Michael Schofield a special shout out for his assistance in the initial planning stages of the library techcast. The views held by the hosts of the Library Techcast are their own and not representative of any organizations they may be associated with. <laughs>